Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Hey, aloha, and welcome to Stand the Energy on, on Friday the 13th. Don't be too afraid, it's just me. Anyway, we've got a great show today, but in case you haven't noticed, there's a biker gang that's been taking over Honolulu. But they're not the ruthless, evil biker gangs you're used to seeing on TV and in the press. These are nice bikers. Some of them are tourists, some of them are local folks getting to work. They're the kind of bikers we want to see. So in today's show, we have uh, as a guest, Lori from Bike Share Hawaii, and she's going to tell us all about what's been going on with Bike Share and what about this bike gang that's taken over Honolulu. So Lori, thanks for being on the show with us today. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me on. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about yourself, how you got into doing what you're doing, and uh, and get us uh, some basics on what, what's up in Bike Share. Sure. Um, uh, it's really interesting for me because I moved to Honolulu 20 years ago and I think when I first came here I thought, oh, this would be a place that you'd be outside all the time, walking, biking, or whatever, and I was surprised at all the cars and how there weren't any options. So I moved mm -hmm. here from San Francisco and lived downtown and I could take, I could walk, I could take the bus, I could take that Muni, yeah. I could take, you know, a taxi, mm -hmm. I had all these different choices and then depending on the day or what I felt like, I could take different, mm -hmm. different things. And that choice wasn't here. And I thought, wow, it's really interesting. This is such a cool place. Yeah. It's a beautiful place. Um, should be able to walk around more and bike around more and what have you. Mm -hmm. So um, when the opportunity came up and Bike Share Hawaii was formed, I thought, you know, I think this is something I can help make happen. Great. So uh, the Beakies, as we call them, yep. have been out there since, what, December or late last year sometime? So we were out in uh, late June of last year. Okay. So it's been going on ten, nine or ten months. I should have I'm counted that. Up on the yes, year, huh? I know. It's like we're have a one-year baby anniversary. We are. Well, I, well, I suggested maybe we have a baby luau. Yeah. <laughs> a Beaky baby <Perfect>. luau. <laughs> um, yeah, and uh, it's been an interesting, I've been um, involved with this project for three and a half mm -hmm. years. I think that's one of the things wow. that surprises people is uh, people think it happened overnight, and it's like the guy who worked at the, you know, did little small parts in a show, and all of a sudden gets this big starring role, but they've been working for 15 years yeah, towards yeah. that. Sort of feels like that a little bit. Okay. Yeah, and, and it's it's interesting because I've watched this grow. I've been in my position at HCAT for almost five years now, and it's it's a glacial pace when you're dealing with all the wickets that you have to go through to right. get these things going and get the funding right and get the permitting right and all that stuff, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, but... It's nice to see things come together, and it's also interesting to see people proved wrong because some of the first things that came out when Beaky showed up on the streets is, it'll never work, nobody's going to use it, it ain't happening, you know, why would anybody want to ride a bike, blah, blah, blah. And much to my pleasure and surprise, I see more bike stands out there, I see more bikes out there, I see more people riding bikes mm -hmm. out there, and all the naysayers have just kind of been proven at least partially wrong, pretty wrong as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. But um, what kind of growth have you seen and what kind of good news and bad news story? What do you learn along the way? Those kind of things. We learn something year. every day. Okay. You know? So besides the nobody's going to use it, it was also the bikes are going to be st all be stolen. Uh -huh. They're going to, parts are going to be ripped off, uh, all sorts of uh, mm -hmm. things. And, and we had seen that that was the situation in other cities before was that uh -huh. idea of uh, sort of, it's going to be terrible, yeah. um, but at least we had some best practices to mm -hmm. look at. So, um, but what we keep learning is about who rides it, who doesn't ride it, what are, what's keeping them from riding it. We've done a membership survey in October and we're actually going to do another one today trying to sort out some of these things. Mm -hmm. Now, we do know that ridership is low on rainy days. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> and higher on uh, nicer days. Mm -hmm. uh, that weekdays are higher than weekends. Uh, mm -hmm. Because the majority of our rides are residents, okay. about 65%. So then on Friday tends to be our biggest day mm -hmm. because it both has a combination of, of people who are riding and commuting mm -hmm. and then people who are going Pauhana and visitors that have come in for a long weekend, whether, you know, and all of that. So that tends to be the biggest day for us. Yeah, the, the uh, last week's show we had uh, Lee Chamberlain from Maui who rents out uh, electric bikes and um, sells them also. He sells uh -huh. and rents. Yeah. And his, of course, his uh, market is mostly tourists for mm -hmm. the rentals. Sure. Um, but he says that it's going gangbusters over there and people really love it. 
And um, he's into, you know, non-electrified bikes too. In fact, he was going to ride a, a regular bike and his wife was going to use an electric bike to kind of, he's an athlete. Yeah. He was going to let his wife keep up. But then he tried an electric bike and he is totally sold on it. And now <laughs> that's all he's doing. But it's amazing to me, like you say, that we live in the perfect place where it's usually sunny, especially in the summertime. Right. And trade winds and all why can't you jump on a bike to go a few blocks instead of jumping in your car or fighting for I get to places faster on my bike than people driving because I don't have to find a parking place right. you know the hardest part for me sometimes is finding a place to chain my bike up because there's mopeds chained there or or there's no or there's no place to chain them up especially in outside the core of the city here mm -hmm. so I got to go find a sign or a tree or something to chain my bike to but um, it's it's interesting. I, I think it's going to grow, and and I'm I'm happy to see it's not just tourists using it. Um, some folks, most of the folks I see aren't tourists using it. They've got a briefcase on the back. It's neat that you have the basket in the front. That's pretty utilitarian. A lot of people use that to go shopping and, and take care of small errands. But um, here we are in Hawaii, and all the gyms that you pay membership for are doing gangbusters, and that that scratches my head too. I'm like. Just like the bikes, <laughs> why are we paying for gym membership when we could go rent a Beaky and go ride around? Well, you know, that's the cool thing about Beaky is that it can be used for a lot of different things. So I use it primarily for getting for short trips. I drive too, you know, mm -hmm. I'm not against cars, but you know, sometimes there's times where it's just easier. Mm -hmm. As you talk about, it's, um, I live downtown and I work in Kaka'ako mm -hmm. or Ward area. And so for me to hop on a biggie, get it downstairs, I put my laptop on the front, I put my purse in the front, I wear what I'm wearing right now, I wear a dress, mm -hmm. whatever, and I get to the office in like 12 minutes, mm -hmm. and that's from door to door. And not all sweaty or anything, no. it's usually an easy pedal. No, I gotta say, you know, 20 minutes, then you'll start to yeah. sweat. There's sort of like this, I, I actually mm -hmm. tested it out because one of the, my goals was to get more women riding. Mm -hmm. And um, so what were the factors that would make a difference in mm -hmm. that? And one of them was the comfort of the bike and mm -hmm. the feeling that the bike was something that they could handle. But the other thing was, you know, that the trips would be short and mm -hmm. that they could wear makeup and your hair can look okay, you yeah. know, and you can wear a dress. And um, so yeah, we actually have, yeah, you so. don't have to worry about that unless you're Scottish, I guess, <laughs> wearing a kilt. Um, but um, it's, uh, we actually found that we have 43% of our rides are taken by women. The mm. national average is 34%. So um, some of the things that we put in place to help encourage women to ride um, make a difference. Great. And I think, the, I think one of the things is like people have this picture in their head of who a bicyclist is. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that Beaky Riders are bicyclists. I think you're right. You know, they, they don't think of themselves that way, you know, and that's yeah. good. I mean, our goal was not to appeal to people who already bike, because mm -hmm. they already bike. It's like, how do we bring biking as a transportation option yeah. or an exercise option to people who don't? Mm -hmm. So how can it be a mainstream, everybody does it thing? Mm -hmm. And so that's what's interesting to me is they're not cyclists, and I would never even consider them that way. Yeah, in fact, Lee last week mentioned... He, he drew the distinction and said, you've got the uh, spandex guys right. and you got everybody else. And, yeah. and he said, cargo bikes are amazing. They, you can put 400 something pounds on a cargo bike and do all kind of, you know, carry your family or a bunch of groceries or whatever. And that's not biking in his, it, it's like, it's a di it's transportation. It's different, yeah, it's a different animal. Yeah. And, and I think, uh, I'm sure Lee and, you know, as you go to other places around the world or even around the country, mm -hmm. uh, you see some of those things in place and it gives you this idea about, this is about transportation for everybody. Yeah. Yeah, you just made me flashback. I used to travel a lot to Asia, and um, I remember going to Vietnam and seeing all these bikes and mopeds just crowding the streets. But as they get more and more money, they want to drive cars. cars. Yeah. And I'm just going, it's going to be pure chaos when they have cars mixed in with all these bikes. It's just going to be, it's going to be a carnage. It's just going to be ugly. But they, that's their mode of transportation. I've seen refrigerators carried on bikes. I've seen huge... Big screen TVs, it's amazing what a bike can do. It is amazing. I was in Vietnam that, not that long ago, too, and I actually rode a bike over there. Mm. And um, that was a very interesting experience because uh, the congestion of bikes was something that I wasn't used to. Exactly. And um, you know how you go there and cross a street, and they say, just go, don't yeah. worry about it, you know, just cross. It's scary, but it works. It was scary, and it works. <laughs> and it was the same thing with the bikes. It was this ability to just sort of know where people are. Yeah. Same in Copenhagen and stuff. You see a similar thing. Uh -huh. Where people are very comfortable, they don't need the space like I feel I need. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I need a margin of uh, room yeah. uh, to feel comfortable. But I guess that's how people adapt in time. Yeah. So, what were some of the other?
fun things you learned as Beaky started growing from its roots a year ago? So some of the fun things that we learned is that people will use it for exercise. Hmm. We didn't even think about that. So um, we know a few people who have told us that they have, they get the $25 a month plan, which gives hmm. them unlimited rides up to 60 minutes. So hmm. they could do it 20 times a day. Of, well, I don't know if there's enough hours in the day, but they could take as many rides in the month as they hmm. want for $25 as long as they're under an hour. Mm -hmm. So um, there's some people, that's what they do for exercise. So they go down to a Beaky station, they check out a bike, they have a membership card, mm -hmm. they check it out, ride around for 45 minutes or so, check the bike in, and mm -hmm. voila, they have their exercise. their exercise. That technique worked well for me. You wouldn't know it by looking at me right now, but when I was a younger individual, um, and I was going to flight school, um, my wife was pregnant, so the car stayed home with her. And for a year, I rode my bike to work every day. It was six miles to work, and I'd ride to work, home for lunch, back to work, back after work. And I stayed in better shape yeah. just from those four trips a day than if I'd run you know, 20, 30, 40 minutes every day and worked out in the gym. It's, it's really good exercise, and I was, I was surprised. I wasn't shocked, but I was really surprised that the younger guys in my unit were totally out of shape because they weren't doing anything, and I was just smoking past them on the running track because the bike, the bike got, kept me in good shape. I think it was uh, Jenny Pressler, Dr. Jenny Pressler, Department of Health, who said that the society's done a great job of engineering any kind of exercise out of our daily lives. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, and it's if you think go back, you know, it was mm -hmm. part of what was just part of what we did as human beings, mm -hmm. you know, and some of the more um, you know, post uh, mail carriers, yeah. you know, they walked, yeah. you know, and it was all part of it. And I think that's. Uh, along with the exercise story, there's the side benefit of using it as commuting. And we've also heard stories of uh, somebody at one of the publications here who said that they started riding to and from, and then it gave them the idea, oh, you know, I feel a little bit better. And then they adjusted their eating habits a little bit, and they mm -hmm. lost 30 pounds. Yeah. And it's like, well, that's great. Those are great success yeah. stories. You, you got to write some articles for HMSA about that. Yeah, I we should. They, they, I mean, they have a great publication, and it goes out to a lot of people in Hawaii. No, that and, would be uh, good. That would probably help your business, too. And they're a donor of ours. You know, we're mm -hmm. a nonprofit, yeah. and they're, they support us, and we appreciate that. Yeah, Lori, and... do a story for them. They'd, I'm sure they'd publish it. Great. Yeah. So the one thing I always wondered about is, you know, I mean, I'm an I'm a information technology, um, I don't want to say fanatic, but I don't like it. I'm, I'm petrified about putting too much of my personal information online mm -hmm. or using a computer to buy stuff. Sure. So you got your charge card and you go to a beacon station, right. you run it. Have you, and I don't want you to give no, away no. any, any fr uh, fragilities of your system or frailties, but have you run into any problems with the charge cards and, and getting your, your passes and things like no, that? No, one of the main things is we understand that we don't want anybody to be defrauding, right. you know, or, or doing any of the skimming or any things that happen at some of these uh, that can happen out there. So. Um, we do have safeguards in place. Mm -hmm. uh, we do not store anybody's uh, credit card information. That all that's sits good. with a financial institution. Mm -hmm. uh, that's really not our core competency. Mm -hmm. So we work through a payment gateway, and all of Great. those are secure and you know heavily monitored in order for us yeah. to be able. Because that's to get a big comfort that. factor, I think, for a lot of people, especially in my generation, or particularly with my background in the military. Sure. I know what can be done, and it scares the bejeebies out of me. I, I, I went to the bank one day to transfer some money. Um, and, and they said, oh, you can just go online and do that. And I go, I can, but I'm not going to. Yeah. And I refused to do it. And they were looking at me like, why? It's so easy. I go, that's the problem. It's so easy. Mm -hmm. If it's easy, other people can, can take advantage and, and you know, break in and, and manipulate it. I go, I don't do important things like finances online. Okay. I may buy with my credit card, but I usually go through PayPal or somebody, sure. things like that. So I have yeah. one place for my charge card is registered, and that's it. But it's good that you, you thought about that up front because a lot of businesses are a little behind on that. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a really important thing to consider in this day and age. We want to try to keep our customers' information as safe as we can um, and give them, give them good access to Beaky, but also mm -hmm. have the safeguards in place to try to help block any fraud or skimming or any of the other negative things that could happen. Uh, that's good news. Yeah. Well, we're going to take a quick break here and get back with Lori in a few seconds. and. Find a little bit more about what's been happening in the Beaky world here in Honolulu. Hi, I'm Pete McGuinness Mark, and every Monday at one o'clock, I'm the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Research in Manoa. And at that program, we bring to you a whole range of new scientific results from the university, ranging from everything from exploring the solar system to looking at the Earth from space, 
going underwater, talking about earthquakes and volcanoes, and other things which have a direct relevance, not only to Hawaii, but also to our economy. So please try and join me, one o'clock on a Monday afternoon, to Think Tech Hawaii's Research in Manoa, and see you then. Good afternoon, my name is Howard Wig. I am the proud host of Code Green, a program on Think Tech Hawaii. We show at three o'clock in the afternoon every other Monday. My guests are specialists, both from here and the mainland on energy efficiency, which means you do more for less electricity and you're generally safer and more comfortable while you're keeping dollars in your pocket. Hey, aloha and welcome back to Standard Energy Man. We're, we're doing bikes this month, apparently. We were on Maui doing bikes last week and today we're on Oahu doing bikes and talking to Lori from Bike Share Hawaii and kind of getting a feel for how the Beaky bike is doing in Honolulu and apparently it's doing pretty darn good. Um, and surprising us in a lot of ways, like for exercise rather than just transportation and um, maybe more women riding bikes here than on other places on the mainland. So some interesting things happening. So another interesting thing is, you know, you're kind of a different business or a different model. So how does all that work? I mean, how do you put it all together and, you know, make it all happen? Well, we're very convoluted. I mean, we're very different than almost anybody I can think of. Um, we're what I call a P4. Okay. <laughs> so we're a public-private nonprofit partnership. Uh, when the city did a feasibility study about bike share in 2013, they identified the idea that probably the, the best way to, to organize it would be to set up a nonprofit, support it initially, because then it would be able to operate a little bit more freely than if mm -hmm. it was within um, the city, uh, the city. Uh, but then control it, right? So we work closely with the city. So the city uh, and now the state and UH and different people, only, we only go where we're permitted to go okay. and we have all of the approvals to go. So that's the public nonprofit side okay. of it. And then we have a for-profit operator. Okay. And the other reason, uh, so the for-profit operator invested in the equipment and is taking, doing all of the operations. Mm. So they're the ones taking most of the financial risk, mm. which is pretty interesting. It's like, why would they do that? So it's almost like uh, on the utility side, like a power purchase agreement where- That I don't I, know what you where you have a Where you have a, um, an entity that comes to your house and says, I'll put the solar on your roof, I'll maintain it, I'll take care of it if, if it breaks, you just owe me the amount of money you pay for electricity. So, yeah, so, a, so a company is, is actually owning the equipment, operating the equipment, repairing the equipment, like you're leasing it, mm -hmm. but they're working through a nonprofit instead of a personal yeah. purchaser. Yeah, maybe the difference, uh, a slight difference is that there you have no guarantees of you know what money they're gonna make. That's true. So, so um, I, I, I think it's interesting in that the reason that they would do it is that um, on the mainland there's one big bike share mm -hmm. operator and not much competition. So one mm. of the things they thought was if we can come in here and do a good job for the community here, then it mm. gives us something in our portfolio sure. to go pitch other business. So that was worth some of the risk to them. Um, so in that regard, they, we work under an agreement with the city and then uh, they work under an agreement with us. And okay. it's multi-year. Okay. Um, and then uh, we talk about expansion. So in that case, now we have another source of funding, mm -hmm. which is federal TAP funding, Transportation Alternative Program. Oh, okay. So that's that's been come in through the state, and then that's uh, devoted to bike share equipment. And so that's what funds the expansion. So we'll have equipment okay. that's owned um, by the public and equipment that's owned by private, and then we'll hold it all together. Okay. So, um, so cobbling all that together means that Bike Share Hawaii, we're supported by grants and donations. We're a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. uh, also, the initial startup funding that we got from the city and the state to do everything to get it ready to mm -hmm. go and get us on our feet. And then um, the operator looks for fair revenue to help offset their operating mm -hmm. costs and their costs. So um, what's interesting in all of that is I think a lot of people think we're making a lot of money because they see so many people riding it. Yeah, exactly. And that's fair. I would think the same thing too. Um, but, but because it's residents and because we wanted mm -hmm. residents to ride, and when I conceived it, it was we want more ridership at a lower margin than... I remember that. Uh, I remember that being remember kind that? of controversial, in fact. Yeah, it was like, let's get more uh, residents riding. Mm -hmm. um, and so in that case, though, if it's $15 in a month, I could ride 10 times a month or 60 times a month, which is more like what I do. Mm -hmm. It's not increasing the revenue. Mm -hmm. 
it's in, it's increasing the value to me, right. but it's not increasing revenue towards operations. Yeah, that was actually one of the critiques I heard early on. This you're not charging enough, um, and then others are saying you're charging too much for local yeah. people. Was, that to me was kind of weird because I went, how can that be at the rate it takes to drive a car with insurance and gas and everything else and parking? How can you be more expensive? But well, you guys we wanted, we wanted, we wanted people. We wanted people riding it because the mm -hmm. idea is not having price be a hurdle for them. Right. So we, we. So that's why we have the fifteen dollar monthly plan. But what's most popular is what we call the free spirit plan. Mm -hmm. So the free spirit plan for twenty bucks, you get three hundred minutes that don't expire. Well, mm -hmm. they expire in ten years, and um, so that you're ready to ride whenever. So you don't have to. So you can use it spontaneously. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a way. It's like, I'm going to drive today or I can't, uh, something comes up, I'll use Beaky. You know, people can get into it that way. So you, you purchase the 360 minutes? It's 360? 300 minutes. 300 minutes? So it's like five hours. Okay. And then what happens then, um, you check out a bike, clock starts, yeah. tick, 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 tick. And when check you stick it in, it, in, it stops. stops. And then it subtracts that from the yep. 300. And, and so when you get up to 285 or 290, you maybe add another 300 minutes? Yeah, so there's auto renew, which is what okay. we suggest people do, because it's only going to auto renew if you're using it. Right. And then it keeps you out of those kinds of uh, situations yeah. where it's like, now I just got an overtime fee because it yeah. didn't renew yeah. and I didn't do it in time. And, you guys yeah. Everything. Tried to think of stuff. Uh, so let's put up that map of where the bike stations are going so people can stop freeze on the YouTube video here and check yeah. and see where their, their nearest station is. But you know, you got a pretty good expansion in there. And I like to see Diamond Head in that because I used to have an office over in that area, and that's that's actually a really great place to ride a bike out of Copilani Park and Diamond Head. Um, but you mentioned that not only the counties but the university had to be kind of part of this consortium to pull it all together. How do you get into other communities? I mean, do you approach like Mililani or Kailua and, and say, hey, we want to expand into your area? Is that something you're looking at in the future? Or have you got like a, a very structured plan to do those things or neighbor islands or, you know, what are, what are you kind of thinking long term? So um, the first feasibility study covered sort of urban Honolulu right. and some of the ob obvious places. So we're using that as our first place to look. That's mm -hmm. part of the expansion that we're in now is really sort of executing what it said to do the first time. We yeah. didn't have enough money to do as much as right. in the first uh, first iteration. And then the plan is to do a full plan for the whole uh, state. Mm. And then in that case, then you see bike share doesn't make sense everywhere. It's like, where does it make sense? Mm -hmm. And where do other modes, you know, where whether it's electric bikes or right. whatever in different places when mm -hmm. you have higher distances or hills or whatever, try to cobble together the right thing for mm -hmm. that. And there's different kinds of bike share too. So um, so initially what we're looking at is between our initial, uh, the initial feasibility study, and then also what we've heard from people. Mm -hmm. um, people are like, why aren't you at a UH? And it's like, well, easier said than done. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but now uh, we do have a right of entry with U University of Hawaii mm -hmm. and Manoa. And then you say, well, if we're gonna be there, then where are people coming from? Mm -hmm. And that's where you get into the upper Makiki mm -hmm. area, where you have all that density. Yeah. Um, and then also into the Makali Mo'ili'ili. Yeah. We've been light there, so trying to fill that in. Mm -hmm. And then fill in some of the areas where we're not as, where we just don't have the presence we need mm -hmm. to be have. And then Ivale is interesting. Uh, we want to provide this to the full community and not right. just say, well, we're just serving the wealthy areas. Right. Um, Avalé is an interesting place. There's a lot of uh, business down mm. there. There's a Public big housing. theater down there. There's a lot of opportunity yeah. for us to be able to serve more people. Mm -hmm. And it connects into the Chinatown mm -hmm. area. Um, so, so that's another area. And then the Diamond Head Kapahulu is mm. perhaps a little bit more recreational in the sense right. that people are going up to uh, the farmer's market mm. or... They just want to ride around Diamond Head, yeah. which you can do on a beaky bike. Yeah. It's uh, geared very, it's geared, you go in the lowest gear and you're not going fast. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, uh, but you can get up the hill so that people can go the places they want to go. Mm -hmm. They need to have a beaky stop there. Yeah. So otherwise, it's just a ride around. But if they want to stop and have coffee or go to the farmer's market or whatever. Okay. It, so that's for the expansion. Mm -hmm. But, you know, one of the important things that I'm learning in the hydrogen transportation side is that the infrastructure is kind of important. Yes. So your partnership with the city must help quite a bit in terms of you at least have some significant input on bike lanes and um, and maybe making multi-mode walkways and bikeways that that are that would benefit like um, companies or businesses that are along those things. 
Because like, I've talked to city councilmen and stuff, and they go, hey, if we did that over there, it'd kill all the parking. The vendors would, would go up in arms. We'd have protests at City Hall. Like, we can't take away it the on-street parking. Right. We can't do this and that. But, you know, in the bigger picture sense, if you did something on a, a much grander Fort Street Mall that went east to west, um, and you had much more foot traffic and bike traffic going by these stores and not have to worry about finding a parking place because right. it's easy to get there mm -hmm. now, um, it, there'd be a benefit. So what are you guys kind of looking at with the city on the infrastructure side? So um, we are the, ch somebody's the chicken and somebody's the egg, and I'm not sure which is which, okay. but uh, the city does have a complete streets program where mm -hmm. they look for opportunities to be able to improve the walkability and bikeability mm -hmm. when they have a project going on. We stay aware of those things. Okay. I think what how Beaky contributes is that we do provide data to the city, Great. and we have an open API also, so we provide it to anybody uh -huh. who can use it as far as our usage data, not, not individual data, but uh -huh. you know trip data. And then, then people can see, well, where are people going? They're uh -huh. starting here and ending here, that kind of information. Yeah. So you say, well, we don't know, because they're not GPS enabled in that sense. Yeah. We don't know exactly the route, but we can infer it. Yeah. And so that helps support, I think, what people want from a bikeable, walkable place. Uh, the challenge has always been, if you put in a bike lane and nobody rides it, then the people who are, when they're driving, say, why did you take away? Why did you take away that lane? Um, yeah. If you have people on bikes and they're riding on the sidewalk or they're riding somewhere where it's not particularly safe, then people say, why don't you have bike a lane. place? Yeah, yeah so, so it starts this cycle of mm. people thinking about it. And when we're doing 26, we did 3,000 trips on Tuesday. We're over, well over 600,000 trips to date. When that many mainstream people, I would say, mm -hmm. are using bikes, then that helps create more of a political support right. for some of the kinds of things to be done. And um, people then that can go out and say, mm -hmm. yeah, this is something we want. We know safety, perceived mm -hmm. safety, is the main reason people don't bike. Yeah, I, I definitely will stay on the streets if I feel safe. Mm -hmm. But the things that impact me riding my bike are the potholes that yes. are on some of the streets, right. the um, the narrowness when you have parked cars on one side where somebody can swing a door open right. in front of you, and then the um, amounts of space in the lane next to you to, to get around that yes. without getting hit by a car. Right. That impacts me. And when I see that, I'll get on the sidewalk. Yeah. I don't ride fast on the sidewalk. I'll move as slow as a pedestrian because mm -hmm. it's their space. Right. But if I can't ride on the street, that's what I'm forced to do. And unfortunately, the police can be really strict on that, and so they'll start citing people on the sidewalk, and that's not good. Right. Because sometimes, as a as a person on a bike, not a bicyclist, right, right. you're not trying to do you know speed racing on right. this thing. You just want to get someplace. Right. You don't have the option staying on the street. So, if there's one input I can make to all these guys, it's, it's like, hey, let's do a little bit better job of of looking at those spaces and making it safe for bikes to get around. Totally, I think that that's very helpful. The other thing that I hope is more people that get on a beaky, then when they get behind the wheel, they'll think more about what it's like to be on the bike. Exactly. And um, I think all of us, one of the things that just seems like we don't do as much is think about we're all people. Yeah. You know, sometimes I'm uh, driving a car, sometimes I'm on mm -hmm. a bike, sometimes I'm walking, but I'm hoping that people around me are thinking of me as the same person, right. <laughs> no matter <target>. what vehicle, <laughs> yeah, not a target. whatever vehicle I'm choosing at that time mode. Well, believe it or not, Lori, we've hit the end of our 30 minutes and it's time to wrap it up. So we're going to give you another year or maybe six months to uh, collect some data and we'll have you back to talk more about uh, Beaky's success and maybe where you've grown into. But thanks for coming on the show today. We'd love really to. Thank you very it. much. Appreciate the time. Thank you All for right. having me. Well, thanks. Okay, so until next Friday in Stanton Energy Man, uh, we're signing off. Uh, thanks to Cindy and Robert here in the control room in the studio for uh, keeping our act together, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you next Friday. Aloha.